Thank you for joining us. My name is Brian Elaine, and I'm here today with Dr. Miguel A. De La Torre, who is Professor of Social Ethics and Latinx Studies at the ILF School of Theology in Denver. He's published over 41 books, including Burying White Privilege and Reading the Bible from the Margins. His latest book that we will be discussing today is titled Resisting Apartheid America, Living the Badass Gospel. <clears throat> Miguel has served as the president of the Society of Christian Ethics and served as the executive officer for the Society of Race, Ethnic Ethnicity, and Religion. In 2020, the American Academy of Religion bestowed on him the Ex Excellence in Teaching Award, and the following year, the American Academy also conferred upon him the Martin E. Marty Public Understanding of Religion Award. Miguel is a recognized international Fulbright scholar who has taught courses and lectured all around the world. You can learn more about all of his work at drmigueldelatore.com. So, Miguel, thanks so much for joining us, and congratulations on all your amazing work. Thank you for having me. So maybe to get started, what else would you like people to know about you than what I briefly touched on? <laughs> um, I, may, maybe that um, the Academy is my second career. Um, originally, I was in the business world and in the political really? world. Yes, yeah, so it, um, it, it adds a certain realism to when I write, because rather than spending my life living in an ivory tower, I've actually had to meet payroll. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, a realization of what actually um, is going on within uh, the business world, the political world, and, and I bring that knowledge into my writing as well. Mm. I, I find that you and I are a little bit unique in that regard of coming from the business world into kind of the, you know, Christian publishing theolo theological world. And um, I think you're, I totally agree with this. It's, it's a very helpful perspective to have. Indeed. So um, what, tell us a little bit more about the work that you do, you know, before we get into the books, what, what other kinds of things are you up to these days? Okay. So basically the work that I do um, deals with liberation theology. It's a 1960s way of thinking that uh, came out of Latin America. And, and what that basically means is that whenever I do any type of work, any type of project, um, my main concern is how it is understood from the perspective of those who are marginalized. Marginalized due to their race, due to their ethnicity, due to their gender, due to their orientation, and due to their class. Um, so anything I, I put my hand on, I'm, I'm working on books on ecological justice, I'm working on books on political justice, um, in, in all of those books. There's always that focus of the perspective of the marginalized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, before we talk about the new book, there are two earlier books that basically comprise a trilogy with this third one. Can you tell folks about those first two books before okay. we get into the third one? Well, the first book, The Burying White Privilege, really, I wrote an op-ed that was like 600 pages, I mean, 600 <laughs> words long. It's a short <laughs> op-ed. And, um, and it kind of went viral. Mm. Um, so Urban Press contacted me and asked me, would I go ahead and write this into a book? So um, I did under the conditions that it wasn't going to be heavy on footnotes and, 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 and theoretical, but it was going to be written to the average person who may not have a depth of knowledge about theological education. Mm -hmm. and, and what that first book attempted to do is to understand the how, how uh, white supremacy, uh, specifically the rise of uh, white Christian nationalism, is really undermining the entire gospel and Christian message. Um, so when the book came out, it, it received good reviews, but many of the reviewers kept complaining about um, that um, De La Torre does a good job explaining the problem, but he doesn't give us any solutions. <laughs> so I wrote the second book. And in the second book, I basically made the argument, number one, um, if you are involved in an abusive relationship, you don't ask the abused person to come up with the solutions mm -hmm. for their abuse. You know, um, uh, and secondly, I wasn't writing to the dominant culture I was writing to those who are oppressed and whose minds have become so colonized that they see themselves and understand themselves through the eyes of their oppressors. Mm. So that was the gist of the second book, the decolonizing Christianity. Okay. 
This third and last book um, is an attempt of playing the prophet. In other words, I'm trying to look into the future based on what is going on today in this country. And what I see scares me. I, I see us moving more and more towards an apartheid-type political structure in where what may end up being the minority um, will quickly uh, will continue to hold on to the power structures at the expense of the emerging majority of people in this country. Well, we've certainly seen things going in that direction. Um, I mean, I would say over the last six years in particular, it's been accelerated. And um, I would agree with you that it could likely get worse before it gets better. Yes, if it gets better. And, well, and that's, that's that's the thing, right? I mean, you, you kind of in the book say things are hopeless. I think you used that word at one point, um, which, you know, I don't like to say. I don't like to admit that myself, you know, mm -hmm. that there's, you know, uh, although I can understand the rationale for it. I mean, is that really what you think? It's hopeless? I wrote a book called Embracing Hopelessness. And, and, and what I argue in that book is that it really, you know, that, that the idea of hope is based on a understanding of history <clears throat> that is linear and progressive. But that is a Eurocentric construct <laughs> of trying to un, uh, trying to give meaning to the randomness of events that occur every day. But if I believe that it's progressive and 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 linear, then I could have hope that at the end it's all going to work out. But for the vast majority of people in the world, um, they are dying of starvation, they're dying of war, they're dying of of of, of uh, pandemics. So. In a very real way, there is no hope for them. Um, the, you know, these problems are not going to be solved. We, we was, we're literally a facing a global neoliberal economy that is making the vast majority of the planet uh, poor and poorer. I mean, over two billion people, almost a quarter of the world's population, struggle to find food every day to eat. So. To say that it is hopeless is, is to embrace the reality in which where we live. And, and my fear is that hope has become a middle-class privilege. Because as long as I have hope that it's all going to work out in the end, I don't have to really do anything. Because God or science or good politicians will solve the problems for me. So if I'm going to be in radical solidarity with the oppressed of the world, I have to share in their hopelessness that their children may die, that they may not be able to feed themselves, that they may, that, that, that death is a real possibility, if, if not immediate, at le, you know, in most cases, early death compared to the privilege of the world. So it's not that I want to embrace hopelessness, it's that I cannot do ethics. I cannot get involved in finding or, or working towards possible not solutions, but but possible tracks that might lead us to closer to something that's a little bit more just. If I don't recognize the depths of of, of the situation, mm -hmm. I I understand that perspective better now. Um, so well, so just, just 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 real fast. I mean, white supremacy is not going to end in my lifetime, or in the lifetime of my children or my grandchildren. I mean, it's been around for literally centuries. Yeah. So what makes me think that just because, you know, this generation might just be woke, that we're going to go ahead and, uh, and, 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 and do away with it once and for all, it will find new ways of manifestation. And that's the hopelessness of the situation. So, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, uh, it's not going to go away, but that doesn't mean that things can't improve oh absolutely things can improve or things can get worse there is no there, there is no um guarantee of which of those two paths absolutely <laughs> absolutely but whether we call that hopeless or hope either way I, I think it boils down to what do we do about it 
Exactly. Back to your question, you know, that you mentioned a minute ago. So what kinds of, you know, practical things are you advocating that we do? Well, again, I'm writing the book to people who are hopeless, who are oppressed. And and, my, and what I'm trying, you know, I, I'm not necessarily trying to tell those who are in power what they need to do. Hmm. You know, we always talk about we need to speak truth to power. But, 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 the, but the bottom line is the power already knows what's true. And, and because they know the truth, they stay in power by hiding it. So in reality, what I'm trying to do in these books is talk to the powerless. Hmm. And in talking to the powerless, my first job is to raise consciousness, specifically to um, help them, like, like myself, see ourselves through our own eyes to decolonize our minds that have been um, taught <laughs> and trained to interpret ourselves and interpret our identity by the way those who want to oppress us interpret us. So what are we to do for me? And in these books, what I'm trying to do is raise the consciousness of those who have been marginalized to begin to see and define themselves through their own cultural symbols. Mm. And by extension, to understand their spirituality rooted in their own culture and not a necessarily a Eurocentric culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you use the term in the um, subtitle of the, of the badass gospel. What, what, does, what does that mean? <laughs> it means a gospel that understands the power of the trickster. <laughs> throughout the entire biblical text from the book of Hebrews I mean from, from the Hebrew Bible all the way through the New Testament um, you have trickster images that we have forgotten or we have ignored because of raising up this European uh, personal piety type of Christianity so you have Tamar playing the prostitute in order to get justice she is She's playing the trickster. She's tricking Judah. You have King David pretending to be mad before an opposing king so as not to be slaughtered. Um, you have um, Jacob, um, you know, not knowing that the bride that was given to him was not the one he wanted. And now he ends up with two women. You know, you, you have all these trickster images throughout the entire biblical text. And, 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 and the job of the trickster usually is is to disrupt power structures that are so cemented within the culture that there's really no way to disrupt them. There's no way to overcome them. So what, um, you know, the, the, the badass part of the gospel is the Jesus who walks into a temple and literally overturns the tables, you know, in the structure, the economic structures of his time that could not be overthrown because of the colonizing influences of Rome, the only thing that he could politically do was screw with the system by overturning the tables, by every time when he was asked a question, turning it on his head with a powerball. Um, by, you know, so, so, so really, I see Jesus more of a, as a trickster than anything else. And this is part of um, the culture of marginalized people. Uh, this is not, I'm not inventing anything new. Marginalized people have always had trickster images as a way of dealing with the oppression that they are experienced. So the African-American community has bear rabbit and bear bear. The um, indigenous communities has coyote and spider. Um, Mexicans have cantinfra and Puerto Ricans have... Um, Juan Bobo and Cubans have Pepito. So marginalized communities have always turned to tricksters as a methodology by which to take social action. Mm. So what I'm trying to do is, again, basing the gospel on our own culture, how do we look for these tricksters within the biblical text to guide us in how we do um, our ethical practices? Mm. Interesting. So are there any tricksters that you can point to in society at large today that people would relate to? Well, the, the, the group that I have uh, that has inspired me 
in, in my writings is a gang um, in New York City back in the late 60s called the Young Lords. Mm. And, and I can give you two quick examples of what the Young Lords <clears throat> did. Uh, and, and I was in New York at the time. So this was, you know, for me, and, and, and you know, for, for me, this is not history. I mean, I've, I've, I lived through this. So the Young Lords um, in, in the late 1960s went ahead and cleaned the streets of Spanish Hollow. You know, they got all the garbage, they put them in bags, they put on the street corners. And then they called the sanitation department to come pick up the garbage. But at that time, the sanitation department would only pick up garbage whenever they felt like it in communities of color. So they took those garbage bags to Third Avenue during rush hour traffic, build a, a wall with them and set it on fire. <laughs> and, you know, the cops came, beat them up, threw them in jail. But also the New York Times showed up and started running articles about the sanitation department. Mm -hmm. So... By playing the trickster, they brought attention to an injustice, um, but they, 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 and they they try, they held the government accountable to its own rhetoric of serving its citizens, and by doing that, now they pick up the garbage at, uh, in Spanish Harlem twice a week on a regular basis. The other thing they did, and this is really. Um, you know, it's not just the government, but the church. The second thing they did is that they went to the Primera Iglesia Metodista in Spanish Harlem. And they said, you know, we want to have um, a food closet. We want to have a, clo you know, a, a clothes closet. We want to have um, uh, provide breakfast for our children on the way to school in the morning. We want to have attorney, you know, lawyers here to help our people with their legal cases. And the pastor looked at them and said, ah, you bunch of commies, get out of here. <laughs> So they showed up on Sunday, they picked up the pastor, threw him out of the church, and they nailed on the door the people's church. And 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 they began all those programs. And for a couple of weeks, the church was packed with the community. But the church began to do, you know, to fulfill its rhetoric of what it said it was supposed to do. Eventually, after two or three weeks, the cops came, beat them up, threw them in jail. But the point is, that by playing the trickster, both um, in showing how the government falls short of its rhetoric and show, showing how the church falls short of its rhetoric, new opportunities were created that moved us closer to justice. Mm. This doesn't mean that justice began to reign. <laughs> it does not mean that all the problems were solved. But it means that it moved us closer to something that was a little bit more just than what we had before. So the badass gospel that these books are preaching is the gospel of the young lords. Hmm. Uh, they were not a religious group, but uh, you know, I'm using their example from my own community as a way of understanding the implementation of Christian ethics. Hmm. I find it you know, interesting whenever we have to point to things outside of religion to learn moral and justice lessons you know it's, it's unfortunate uh, it is it is it, that, that, that those who are not the religious leaders have been more moral yeah and more truthful to the gospel yeah than many of us who have claimed to be followers and believers and disciples it's it's sad but it's reality it's an indictment yeah yeah so um i was a little thrown off when I saw that the book is dedicated to Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. <laughs> Can you explain that to us? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. It's, um, I think the first book was dedicated to um, my alma mater, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. <laughs> and and yeah. the second book was, I think, uh, dedicated to um, Sam Rodriguez and a few other Latino um, uh, conservative ministers. Um, and because this one deals with uh, political issues, I, I thought I would dedicate it to those two individuals, um, specifically to emphasize my understanding of whiteness. Um, and, and this is very important because, you know, many people miss this point and therefore say, oh, De La Torre hates white people and, and, and dismiss me. What I hate is white supremacy. And whiteness has nothing to do with skin pigmentation. You know, there are Latinos who may be brown, skin pigmentation, but their ideology is the embracement of white Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. Like 
Ted Cruz and and Marco Rubio. Um, so it doesn't matter that they are lot, you know, they have Latino sounding names. They uh, are pillars of white Christian nationalism, as is um, Clarence Thomas, who sits in the Supreme Court, as are many other people who do not have white skin pigmentation that for all practical purposes have embraced this white supremacist ideology. Mm. Just like there are people who do have white skin pigmentation who are in solidarity with people of color and therefore have become traitors to their own race when it comes to the embracement of, of white Christian nationalism. So I, I, you know, it's important in a conversation like this that we make it very clear that I am not talking about skin pigmentation. Uh, it's an important distinction, no question about that. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we've seen, and you pointed out how, you know, the church has pretty much lost the revolutionary vision of Jesus. Um, what do we do to reclaim that? You know, one of my Dear friends, um, Dr. Vincent Harding, who used to teach here at ILIF um, right before I came here, um, and, and he was for the readers, I mean, for, for, for the audience who may not know, he was the speechwriter for Martin Luther King Jr. Huh. Um, he always would say that the job of the church is just to be ready for when the movement begins. Hmm. You don't begin the movement. You have to be ready for it when it begins. Um, eventually, we will, you know, there will be a movement of reclaiming the radicalness of the gospel. So the issue is, will the church be ready for when that happens? Or will the church be an obstacle and a barrier for, you know, for, for allowing that to flourish? Mm. So I'm not so much into what must we do to get that movement going. I'm more in how do we propel ourselves mm. when that movement begins? Mm. And usually something happens where it begins to click. Um, and, and, and going back to my hopelessness, the reality is that in uh, the Pew just did a study in where uh, in this supposedly Christian nation, 48% uh, of the population claim that they're neither spiritual yeah. nor religious. Yeah. So, you know, maybe the and maybe because the loudest voices representing Christianity have been anti um anti uh, gay, have been anti immigrant, immigrant, have been pro -patri uh, patriarchal. Um we have lost an entire generation or two generations. Um, so maybe books like this that attempt to battle this white Christian nationalism becomes a first step in in in, in pushing back on 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 what has become the norm, the, the normative understanding of what Christianity is. I mean, I think it's really important to have lots of voices pushing back. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing more and more, which, you know, is encouraging to me. And I've had the pleasure of interviewing a lot of folks that have been writing good books in that same direction. Mm -hmm. So um, looking forward to any future books or other projects that you'd like to tell us about. <laughs> well, I do have a, a novel coming out. Oh, wow. Um, next month. It's my it's the first time I ever. Uh, right in that genre. I mean, it's it's it, it, it deals with um, 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 uh, immigrant coming to this uh, immigrant boy coming to this country, um, and it's a, mag a magical realism because it um, the the family practices Santeria, so you have all the Orishas in the background operating. It's a auto uh, an auto fictional um, account. Um, um, I also have another book coming out on. Um, uh, a third edition of Doing Christian Ethics on the Margin, which is a textbook that has been picked up by many um, classes um, in seminaries that teach ethics. Um, working on a book now on, uh, it's going to be called something like Food Fight, When What We Eat is Weaponized Against uh, Us. Uh. It deals with the intersection of food, ecology, 
and 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 racism. Mm. And um, I've I've just began a long project on um, working on a book on violence on on on. on the use of violence as a form of liberation, um, mm. uh, which is a scary book that I'm not quite sure where it's going to lead me. And finally, I have <laughs> a, finally have a, a, another book that should be coming out soon, which deals with um, uh, my intellectual mentor, Jose Mati, mm. which was revolutionary of the 19th century. Mm. So those are the projects that I have um, coming out soon. Well, you're not trying to avoid controversy, I guess, right? <laughs> But, you know, if we're going to turn over tables, that's that's what it takes. Yes, yes. So um, any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? I, I would say that for those who read this book, again, they should remember it was not it was written for marginalized communities so that we could have a conversation among ourselves. And that if the reader is not a member of those communities, they have a unique privilege of eavesdropping into our conversation. So when you eavesdrop, <clears throat> you will hear things that you may find offensive or, 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 or you may really be put off by. But this is the way we talk among ourselves when members of the dominant culture are not around. So it is a, a unique privilege to be allowed to eavesdrop into this conversation. And, and if we approach the book that way, they may, you know, the reader may not agree with everything, but they cannot deny that this is the conversation that we are having among ourselves. Mm. And they have to deal with that. Which is an important uh, perspective, I think, for us to have. So, um, again, the title of the book is Resisting Apartheid America, Living the Badass Gospel. Um, you can learn more about uh, Dr. De La Torre and all of his work at Dr. Miguel de la Torre uh, Thanks so much for all of your work and for joining us to share it with us today. It was my pleasure. You have a good day. Thank you. You too.